Thank you, guys. Um, I get the best Father's Day because I got, particularly as you get a little bit older, I got all three of my kids home today. Uh, so that's what makes for a fun Father's Day and then throw in a daughter-in-law with that. And you're like, you know, you got it all, man. This is awesome. Um, I had one more announcement I'm supposed to make and I have no idea what it is. It'll, it'll come to me in the middle of what I'm doing. I do want to say a special thank you too, though, to those of you who have stepped in and been a dad figure to so many. Uh, that is a very special role and thank you. So we decided we got together, uh, Mitch and Clayton and I are all going to speak today and, and we got together and we voted and we're going to honor one father today as the best father. So I know several of you are about to get out of your seat, whatever, but that award goes to God. Thank you. Um, So we're all going to talk about a aspect of the perfect father, because, you know, I don't know what your experience is with your dad. Some of you didn't have a dad. Some of you, it wasn't a great experience. Some of you, it was a great experience. We all come from a little bit different places there, but as disciples of Jesus, here's what we all have in common. We have a perfect father. And for that, we need to celebrate, have a great day and say, amen, I have a perfect dad. And we're all going to talk about one little aspect. Now, mine is this. Stay with me for a minute, all right? In God, in our perfect father, we have the perfect authority figure. Now, you think about the roles of men and women. You know, we, we, we have Mother's Day and we talk about how nurturing and loving women are. And I do believe it's both biblical and it's the way God wired us and we all know that. And, and yet for men, most of us would and go, men are a little stronger, they're the leader and they, they are the authority figure as we call it in our lives. Now, when I said authority, what did you feel? That's become an ugly word in our society, pretty much across the board. When you say the word authority, it almost always has a negative connotation or negative meaning or certainly a negative feeling associated with it. Some of you might even think that way when we talk about, you know, if your dad was, and sometimes we use this word authoritative, that can be good or bad, right? And so I want us to step back from that a little bit and maybe go, you know what? We need authority in our lives. We do. God set it up. In everything God has ever set up, in the family, we have authority. In the church, we have authority. In government, we have authority. God understood that you and I need authority. And if you don't believe that, think about living in a world where there is no authority. I'm very grateful there are policemen that enforce laws. I don't want to live in a country without authority. Perhaps, and most of us would relate to this, that we all struggle a little bit though, because probably everyone in here, some much more than others, has had an experience in their life where authority has been abused. And so we react and we go, ooh, authority. I thought we were gonna talk about good deaths today. 
And that's where we got to change our thinking a little bit. And we got to appreciate even the men, whether they be our dad or other older men that have been in our lives that, that have been that authority figure. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we need to praise our God that he is the perfect authority figure. I would guess there are a lot of us sitting in here this morning that are a lot like me, that when... Remember what the verse in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11 says, it says, no discipline is pleasant at the time, but painful. And then what's that next, next three words? But later on, depending on what version you're reading, how many of us sit here this morning and you've had people in your life, be it a dad or a coach or somebody that you just went, I don't like those people. They're just too hard on me. But later on, you go, some of the best people God ever put in my life. I hope you'll reflect this morning. We're going to look at three quick things before Clayton comes up about why God is the perfect authority in our life. And we may not always understand who God is putting in our lives. But for a lot of us sitting here, the older we get, the more we realize there's some people that went on before us that knew a whole lot more than I gave them credit for. Three things about God. Number one, I have a father that defines truth. So what does an authority figure do in your life? An authority figure is the one that, anybody else have this? Boy, if I got in trouble, my mom would deal with her three boys. I was the youngest of three. But there was this phrase, you know what's coming. Yep, when your daddy gets home. Why? Because he was sort of the one, as we would say in my family, he lays the law down. That's what we said in our family. And God is that. Isn't it awesome to be able to say to yourself, my dad defines truth. He doesn't follow somebody else's truth. He doesn't learn it from someone else. He defines it. We ought to feel good about that. What did Jesus say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so what does he do with that authority? John 8, 31 and 32, you know those verses. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you follow my authority, then you will know the truth and the truth will what? <sighs> Set you free. Isn't it awesome to know you have a father that defines truth and you know what he does with that truth? He blesses your life and he sets you free. That's an authority that you can love and appreciate in your life and go, I am so glad God is the perfect authority figure and he gives me truth to set me free, to give me the best life I possibly can he doesn't have to ask anybody else. He doesn't have to form an opinion poll and, and, and find out what people think. When he says it, it's what's best for me. Do you appreciate God, your authority figure for the truth he gives you in your life? Secondly, his authority transcends, transcends human perspective. Think about that. His authority, you ever, you ever scratched your head and gone, God, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> I don't get this. And we have that great verse that we all hold on to, Romans 8, 28. 28. For we know that in all things, God, God will work together for good. In God's authority, he is able to see far beyond our human perspective. Isn't it, isn't it awesome to know that whatever God is back there doing in the background of your life, which sometimes makes you scratch your head, 
I laugh sometimes when I hear some of us say, well, obviously what God is doing is, <laughs> oh, be careful with that. You know, it's very apparent to me that God is, because just when you think you got God figured out, he's doing just the opposite of what you think. But you see the security and why I'm so fired up that God is my authority figure is because that authority figure promises me that whatever he's back there doing, whatever he's back there making happen, letting happen, even if that involves people that abuse their authority, God says, that's all right, I can take that. I can use it. I can break your pride with that. I can challenge your arrogance with that, which at the end of the day is gonna help you. Doesn't mean what they're doing is right. And aren't there the Bible full of great stories? Remember David's attitude towards the king, authority? He wouldn't dare, why? Because he trusted that he had the perfect father who's taking care of him. And then finally, God's authority is always just. Again, one of the reasons I think we struggle sometimes, and rightfully so, with authority is we see abuses of that authority. We see where that authority is used to hurt people. And so we react, but here's the confidence that we have in the perfect father that God says, my authority as your dad, I, I will always treat you fair. You can trust in me. You can trust in my authority when other people hurt you. Maybe it's your own physical dad. God says, that's why you need me as your perfect father. I hope you will today celebrate that great authority figure in your life called that. Once there was a Christian woman who lived next door to an atheist man. Every day when the Christian woman prayed, the atheist man could hear her. The atheist thought to himself, she sure is crazy, praying all the time like that. Doesn't she realized that there is no God. Many times while she was praying, he would go to her house and harass her, saying, lady, why do you pray all the time? Don't you know there is no God? But she kept on praying. One day she ran out of groceries. And as usual, she prayed to the Lord, explaining her situation and thanking him for what he was going to do. As usual, the atheist went to the grocery store, heard her praying and thought to himself, I'll prove to her there is no God once and for all. The atheist went to the grocery store, bought a bunch of groceries, took them to her house, dropped them off on her front porch, rang the doorbell, and hid in the bushes, <laughs> waiting to see what the lady was going to do. When the Christian lady opened the door and she saw the groceries, she began to praise the Lord with all her heart, thanking God for providing for her needs. Immediately, the atheist jumped from behind the bushes and told her, you silly lady, God didn't buy those groceries for you. I bought those groceries for you. The Christian lady replied with great joy. I knew the Lord would provide me with groceries, but I didn't know that he would make the devil pay for them. God is our provider. God is our provider. Throughout the Bible, this truth is told over and over again. We see in the beginning of Psalm 23, 
It talks about the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. David also said in Psalm 37, verse 25, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaking or their children begging bread. I want you to consider the way that God took hundreds of thousands of Israelites as they wandered through the desert and he fed them with manna and quail. The scriptures say that their clothes didn't wear out and their feet didn't swell over those 40 years that they were wandering in the desert. Remember how Job, after he had lost everything, the Bible says that the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Consider the promise that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 6, where he says, So do not worry, saying, What shall I eat? Or what shall I, we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. See, when we seek God first and we seek his kingdom first, then we will know that he will be the one who will provide what we need to eat, what we need to drink, what we need to wear, and whatever else we need. God is our provider. Paul even confirmed this as he wrote in Philippians chapter 4. And he said, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God is our provider. See, one of the major challenges for us in thinking about God being that provider is the fact that when God desires to provide for us, he first requires something of us, that we first take a step of faith and are willing to be obedient to him. So many examples throughout the scriptures. When the Israelites, when they were coming into the promised land, as they had to cross the Jordan, it was at flood stage at that point. The priests were leading the way, but that water didn't part until those priests stepped in it. That's when the water began to part and they were able to cross. And when they came to that first city, Jericho, they saw the walls that were around Jericho. They also saw those walls fall. But those walls didn't fall until after they were obedient to God. He says, I want you to march around these walls for seven days. They had to have faith to believe that I'm marching around these walls and what God commands me to do, these walls are going to come down. I don't know about you, but how would your faith be if you got to go to take a city and it's fortified with walls and he tells you to walk around them? What are you thinking when you're walking around those walls? What in the world's going to happen? We're just walking around the wall, blowing trumpets. But God calls us to be obedient and faithful to what he commands. He'll provide what we need. Remember how Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5, he had to dip himself in that water seven times before that leprosy left. The blind man in John chapter 9, when Jesus put the mud over his eyes, he had to go to the pool and dip there before his blindness was healed. You see, God calls us to take that step of faith before that provision comes. One of the most convicting stories in the Bible about a man who took that step of faith to gain that provision that God was providing was the story of Abraham and Isaac. If you look in Genesis chapter 22, Genesis chapter 22, verse one, it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering, one on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Imagine hearing these words. Take your son. Go. Sacrifice him. Take your son. Go. Sacrifice him. You notice in the text, God never gives any kind of explanation as to why he wanted him to do this. He never gave him any kind of reasoning. He just told him to do this. And as we look at this scripture, these scriptures here, there was no hesitation 
on Abraham's part. It says early the next morning, he got up, gathered all the things that he needed, and he did what God wanted him to do. See, sometimes in life, we don't know the reasons why things are happening the way that they're happening. We don't know all that God is doing, but God desires us to be faithful and obedient to him, and he will provide what we need, whatever the situation may be. We have to be the ones who will trust that. And that's exactly what Abraham did. There was no objection. He practiced immediate obedience. Now, it talks about in Hebrews chapter 11, as Abraham, they were going and they were going to be about to go up to that mountain. It says he reasoned. He reasoned that God could raise his son Isaac from the dead. Now, there is no way in scripture before this that that had ever happened before. That there was ever a resurrection. But Abraham's relationship with God was so strong. He said if he needs to raise him from the dead to fulfill this promise, he'll do it. So he didn't have any problem faithfully being obedient to God. Even when what he was commanded didn't really make a whole lot of sense to him. But he was faithful and he was obedient to what God said. See, look down in verse 6 of Genesis 22. In verse 6, it says that the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham then answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Just as Abraham was raising that knife and about to slay his son, that angel told him to stop. And then Abraham looked over and he saw that ram in the bush. I'm so thankful, he said, for that ram in the bush. You see, God will provide that ram for you too. It may not be in a bush. It may be somewhere else. But that ram is there for you. God will provide it. You see, to receive God's provision, we have to have that faith and obedience to step out. Maybe you're sitting here today and there's a need that you have in your life. There's a need that you don't see how it's going to be met. You don't see how that need is going to get accomplished. Maybe you're waiting on a job that you've been waiting on for a long time. Maybe there are challenges that you have with your finances and there's a lot of debt and you're trying to figure out how you're going to get out of that debt. Maybe you've got physical needs. There's an illness that you're dealing with. There's a challenge in your life, an affliction that you have that you don't know how you're going to be able to overcome it. Maybe you're dealing with heartache over a broken relationship. Maybe you're dealing with loneliness. Maybe you're dealing with new relationships. Maybe you're simply having challenges in your own faith, spiritually. And there are temptations and temptations and temptations coming one after the other. And you don't know how I'm going to get through this. Know that there's a ram in the bush. God is our provider. So no matter what your need is today, no matter what may be going on in your life, decide to trust God and be obedient and faithful to him despite the circumstances. As Jesus said, so don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you as well. There is a ram in the bush for you. God is our provider.
I have some uh, arbitrary numbers. You understand that I just picked this, and Rick and I and Clayton didn't vote on this one. <laughs> if you've been a father for 25 years, stand up. If you've been a father for 25 years. I'm just curious to see who you are. Okay? <laughs> Stay standing. And if you've been a disciple for 25 years, stay standing. If not, sit down. 25 years father, 25 years disciple. Okay. Okay. You sit back down. You can sit down. I, I'd like to say to that group that uh, you are... Okay, I'll say it this way. I'll give you a story to this group. Rab rabbis would say that one of the reasons that Jesus chose to tell a kingdom parable about the mustard seed rather than the cedars of Lebanon, because the cedars of Lebanon represent, represented might and power and bigness. But Jesus chose to use the mustard seed because it looks insignificant. It's not as big but it stays the course and continues to grow. I would say to you brothers that stood both times, and I picked this number, that you need to see yourselves, little s, as shepherds at the city gate. You've got 25 years of married to the same woman. You've got 25 years of being a disciple. God wants to use you more than ever the glory days for you are ahead of you. So I hope we get to spend some time together, even as a group, to talk about what the Joshua and Caleb's can do. I left out many people at 23 years old, including 23 years old as a disciple, including one of our elders, Tom and Ed Jones. I picked that number, by the way. So uh, Clayton gave you all the verses I need for mine. And so let me just read you something, and we're not going to put verses on the screen. Uh, because we have plenty to go on already. Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 15, Paul says, just listen. Everybody listen. Let's do it the synagogue way. Just listen. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, Peter in the Greek, P-A-T-E-R, from whom the whole family, Patria, in heaven and on earth is named. In the Greek, it is easy to pick up on Paul's Pater, Patria, Play on words. John Stott chose to translate this phrase, and I think it's a great translation. The father from whom all fatherhood is named. Rick referred to that today. So we're all tying in together here. The father from whom all true fatherhood is named. God is the father. He's the archetype of true fatherhood. What does that mean for us as fathers today? It means that we take our cues from fatherhood, from the father of fatherhood, which is a great relief for many of us because we were fathered by a sinful or an absent father. Realize that's all of us? Sinful or absent, okay? The most obvious feature of the father of Jesus that I want to talk about today is generosity. Now, let me just say before I keep reading verses, this is not about your regular or special contribution. Every dad look up at me. This is about after you decide to do whatever you do, whatever you give. I want to talk about our generosity as fathers after that as a lifestyle. I'm not pursuing money today to give to the church. I'm wanting you to think about, so what do I do with the percentage that's left of my money, my time, my care, my concern, how do I show people the way of Jesus? Jesus is generous with his glory, and God is too, John 1.14. God is generous with his tasks, John 5.18. God is generous with his protection, John 10.28 and 32. God is generous with his home, John 14.1 and 2. God is generous with his joy, John 16, 23 through 24. The Father gives, John 3, 34 through 36. The Father gives his Son, John 3, 16. 
The Father gives his spirit, John 14, 16, and 17, and the Father gives himself, John 14 through 24. As a dad, how are we with generosity? If your kids started naming attributes of their dad this afternoon, would generosity come up? Here's my encouragement today. My encouragement is for fathers who definitely we want to honor. This is not one of those, I said something, now I'm going to get on your case. I want you to think about this. That God is an abundant, extravagant, incredible giver of gifts. He's, he's uh, who's in the room? Okay. He's way beyond Santa Claus, both in reality and some other areas too, but... He is the God of all we see. He is a God that's planning something. The Garden of Eden can't hardly be explained. And he's getting ready to put us in a new heaven, a new earth that all we can look back to and think about, at least for me, my best image, and maybe it's not yours, is the garden before the fall. You just had everything, including walking with God. You had each other. You were going to have family. Again, the patria of patria, the father of all fatherhood. All I'm asking fathers to think about today is, rather than the wives lead in this, would the fathers consider some time in the next couple of weeks going, how can we be more generous? Another way to say this is this. How can we live more simply so that others can simply live? The sacrifice, I'm sorry, giving and generosity is not about how much you give. Widows might, right? It's about how much you sacrifice. So your time to your children, to your grandchildren, to that local small group that you're a part of this week, to your neighbors, to your friends. So we have to deal with what I'm going to say, and it's maybe the only practical thing I'm going to give. You know I do things with letters. People laugh at them, but you remember them. So you can laugh, but I want you to remember I want you to deal in your heart, dads, with what I call OCD. Yeah, you can laugh, go ahead and smile, but it's not the same. I want you to think about in your life, what are the obstacles and the clutter and the distraction to you being a generous father? I tell everybody in here, if you want to get with me, I can tell you how to get out of debt. You might not like the conversation. But it will be very simple. It, will, it won't be hard. It won't be, uh, it'll be basic math. It won't be calculus. It won't be integrals and integers. And is it X plus two parentheses? Do you start with the parentheses? Do you divide by the two first? Or do you, no, it won't be any of that. But you have, as a dad, some obstacles. You have some clutter in your life. You have some distractions. And God has given us incredible gifts. Here's my example, and we close. I think we close. Yep. Old, old, old illustration that Rick and I grew up when we were kids. So God is the giver, and we've seen this, maybe some of us, and he pours out incredible gifts from above. One of those is his Holy Spirit. Go a little bit. Okay. We might go, there's a lot of ways to look at this. We might go one talent guy, ten talent guy. We could do that. There's a lot of other lessons. You artists would come up with all kinds of things that I won't be able to pull off. But the idea of that illustration is obviously, why does God give gifts to his body? Because the body of Christ is made up of so many members. We have so many different gifts. And we imitate Christ with our gifts, which is a little tricky, which means we imitate Christ differently. Did you catch that? We all die to ourselves. I'm not saying anything about the basic dying to self principle that all disciples need to do in order to put their gifts in the body. But our gifts are different. If I try to be Corey, or Corey tries to be me, or if I try to be Reggie, or if I try to be Jim McDougal, if I try... So 
I, so I helped Mark. Mark helped me all day long. I helped him. I didn't do nothing. I swept the trash. Putting, putting back a board in a shower. Do you think I have the gifts Mark Felcher has in carpentry? Shake your head like this. I can't even clean the trash fast enough to get the next board laid down. Oh, you missed a nail. Oh, you missed a staple. Oh, you got to pull. Oh, thank you, sir. You know what I'm saying? You know, gotcha. But here, here's the problem, I think, as we think about OCD and our gifts. And I understand this is actually not going to do exactly what I wanted it to do because of it being eaten away by the oil in the cup. But if you notice, there's a little drip because it's stopped up. Some of us think one illustration would be like the Corinthian church thought, this is loving people. That's speaking in tongues. And Paul had to come and say, can I tell you about the most excellent gift? Loving is the big funnel. This is just part of a lot of things. You need to learn about what's right and what's wrong, how you do it together. But the biggest gift for worship, 1 Corinthians 13, is between 12 and 14. Yeah, wow. So even though it's leaking out a little bit, who would you rather be? So if you eliminate in your life and I'm closing, so the uh, people, yeah, there you go, Kevin. So the people are going to sing. I want you to think about how freeing it would be, how much alive you would become, how much value it would add to your life if you went, I'm going to get in touch with God, I'm going to connect with the gifts, and I'm going to start using them in the body of Christ. And through that, God is going to bless us through understanding God as the perfect authority figure and understanding God as a provider for everything we need, including being generous. And God will help us to be who we need to be as the body of Christ. God bless you, fathers. Have a great day.